there's that. Well, you look great, Megan. You look very <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so guests should be able to join. So we'll just uh, let the participants kind of filter in here and then get started a few minutes after seven or like right at seven. That sounds good. Sounds good. That was great. We like doubled our registration last weekend. Yay. That was great. <laughs> Welcome everyone that's coming in. We'll get started right at seven. So just a few more minutes here. All right, well, it's seven o'clock, so I'm gonna go ahead and kick things off this evening. Um, I'm Megan Marino, I'm the water conservation specialist for the Alameda County Water District. And tonight the rundown will just be to um, introduce the topic and ACWD and our partner agency, Bosca, um, go through some introductory slides about the agencies as well as some Zoom logistics and then I will introduce our lovely speaker for tonight, who will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. But before I begin, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Giselle Delgadillo, who's here with us tonight. She's also a water conservation specialist at the district. So we're partners in crime, and if you sign up for our next uh, webinar, she'll be the one hosting. So without further ado, our theme tonight is Restore Our Earth, One Native Plant at a Time. You'll find out why shortly. Um, but in case you're not familiar, oops, there we go. Um, with Zoom, there's two ways to ask questions. You're muted by default, but that doesn't mean we don't wanna hear from you. We um, would encourage you to either raise your hand or you can um, type a question in the Q&A. We do prefer the Q&A versus chat. Um, just to easily manage the questions. But 
this is being recorded. So please um, be sure to uh, look out for an email after the session to get anything you missed so you can watch the recording later. So this year's uh, Earth Day theme is Restore Our Earth. So thank you for helping us celebrate Earth Day at ACWD. We are really thrilled to host this event around the, the time of Earth Day. And this year is Earth Day's 51st year in celebration. So, um, and this theme is really focused on restoring natural processes that exist in ecosystems in the world versus the, um, the notion that you would mitigate or adapt to address climate change, you know, really just enhancing the natural systems that are in place. So this is a year round effort. And in, um, something that's also year round is water conservation. As many of you may have heard, it's a critically dry year in California this year. Um, there's a lot of buzz around this. And so we just wanna thank our customers for um, their efforts to conserve in the last drought and continuing that effort and encourage you to keep it up. You know, we, we wanna make sure we're using water wisely all year round. And um, as more stuff comes out and it gets drier in the summer, feel free to um, tap into our website. We'll be giving updates throughout the dry summer months at acdivity.org forward slash drought. So a little bit about Alameda County Water District is that um, our goal is to provide a reliable supply of high quality water at a reasonable price. We have been doing this for over 100 years. So we were founded in 1914 and we serve over 358,000 customers and 84,000 connections. So we serve Fremont, Newark and Union City, which is about 105 square miles. And we have three different sources of supply. So this is something that makes ACWD really unique and um, kind of proud because it makes us more resilient to have a unique water portfolio, which is what you're looking at. So 40% of our supply is from the state water project. 40% is from the Alameda Creek watershed runoff, which includes Alameda Creek and the Nowscombe groundwater basin. And then 20% is from the SF Public Utilities Commission. So to keep that conservation strong, we do offer several programs um, for residential customers, including rain barrels, conservation kits, leak detection kits, um, lawn replacement. So we do uh, offer our customers $1 per square foot to switch out their lawn to native or water efficient plants. And a few programs I just wanted to highlight are on the next slide. The Rachio rebate is on the left-hand side. Uh, we offer a big discount for our customers to get this uh, smart irrigation controller at a discounted rate. So what you can do is replace your conventional controller with this smart weather-based system that taps into the local um, weather system. Like if it's raining, it'll automatically adjust your sprinklers to save water and you can control it all on an app. So highly encourage this new smart device, as well as the rain barrel rebate on the right-hand side. And one other program I just wanted to highlight is this WaterWise Gardening website. It's a great resources, resource for anyone that's thinking about changing out their lawn or wants to learn more about plants that do well in the Bay Area. What I love about this site is it shows you pictures and kind of um, also talks about the water requirements for each plant. It's easy to search plants that you like. So um, be sure to visit that website if you're interested. And it's just a little bit about Bosca. So I mentioned earlier that we, ACWD buys 20% of our water from uh, SFPUC and so do 25 other agencies that we all form to make Bosca. So as you can see in the image, there's several Bay Area um, counties and cities that purchase water from SFPUC. So collectively, we serve 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses in the communities of several counties. And they have a very similar goal to ACWD is just to provide high quality supply of water at a fair price. And if you are satisfied with today's presentation, there's several more you can sign up for at bayareaconservation.org. Um, that we'll be having an 
throughout the spring. One that the second one that ACWD is offering that Giselle will host is that one in bold, prepare to irrigate efficiently efficiently this summer. So it'd be perfect timing to learn tips on how to check your irrigation system for leaks and make sure that you're all set for the summer months. And that's May 22nd. That's a Saturday at 10 a.m. But there's several others of whatever topic you're interested in. So just a quick disclaimer, anything that's said does not necessarily reflect the policies of ACWD or BOSCA, but is at discretion of the lecturer. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us um, via phone or email. We're happy to talk further or put a question for us in the chat. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our um, wonderful speaker, Juanita Salisbury. She has a PhD in biopsychology from the University of Florida. And um, she also has a Bachelor of Science in landscape architecture. So as you can tell, wealth of um, knowledge about this subject. And she started her own architect company in 2009. And as well as I'm sure she'll mention tonight, she established the Palo Alto Primrose Way Pollinator Garden in 2016. And from what I've heard this year, it's blooming and really beautiful. So thank you, Juanita. We'll pass it over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing here. Okay, thank you, Megan. Um, so let me pull up my screen then and pull up my presentation. And we'll go to the slideshow from the beginning. All righty. Okay, so uh, the title of my talk, Restore Our Earth, One Native Plant at a Time, so no pressure. Um, the goal of my talk tonight is really to empower people to make some small changes with native plants that have gigantic benefits, even beyond what I discussed tonight in terms of their ecosystem services. Um, as Megan mentioned, I do have a PhD in biopsychology. My area of, of interest when I was in biopsychology was looking at the physiology and the biology of, of ingestive behavior, eating and drinking. And then later I went on to get my degree in landscape architecture. So now I've kind of combined the two disciplines and provide uh, lots of resources for pollinators and other insects. And uh, as Megan mentioned, I did start the Permos Way Pollinator uh, Garden, and you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and also our YouTube channel, uh, Permos Way. We have five gardens now, and um, they're always open. I would highly recommend people uh, go and visit. It makes a nice little walking loop of these five gardens, Primrose, the Gwynda Street Garden, Hopkins Avenue, Arcadia Place, and Island Drive. Most of the plants are labeled um, because there are so many of maybe one species, you might have to look hard for the label, but many of them are, and that should be, uh, that should give you some ideas about how big these things get, what they look like during certain times of the year, that kind of thing. In overview, I'm going to talk about the importance of California native plants and how to really develop a, a California native plant palette, kind of like a painter has a, a paint palette so that they can paint different colors. In this situation, you're planting different plants. So that's what's in your palette. And then how to add those native plants to your landscape. And then something really critical, maintenance and some other considerations because as we shall see, native plants just are not plants. They're not, um, nothing goes on automatic here. It doesn't just run itself. So there are some easy behaviors to incorporate in how you uh, manage your garden. Probably primarily here, I want to make the point, drive it home, um, plants are food and they are the beginning of everything. So energy from the sun is converted by plants and then whatever plants make, then other things eat those plants. Um, here we have a big fat caterpillar chewing on a grindelia. And then because these things eat plants, they are transforming sunlight into protein, or as I like to say, photons to protein. And then those proton, those photons are then uh, 
eaten in the form of protein by birds and other animals up the food chain. So a huge way to really provide nutrition is to plant these plants. 37% uh, of animal species on the planet are, are plant-eating insects. We call them herbivorous because they eat plants. And as a rule, our native insects that we have here in California that have been here for thousands of years generally only eat the native plants that they evolved with. So if you're planting a non-native plant, you're taking up space that could be efficiently transforming those uh, uh, photons into protein. And the role of pollinators in the whole scheme of things is so bees and insects that spread pollen around in the environment, basically what they're doing is spreading genetic material around. That's what they do. And when they do that, they spread around a lot of plants that a lot of diverse types of other insects can eat. So in that way, they, they form a keystone species. And a keystone species, as we'll discuss uh, a lot tonight, are those that provide a lot of resources for a lot of other animals. So when I was in landscape architecture school, they always told us to shrub it up. And I've evolved my thinking about plants in terms of what they do in the environment, what their function is, not just their form, color, and texture, um, but what is it that they do biologically? And so, you know, they're not really decorations, although they are pretty and decorative, but they're, they're food. And so when you plant native plants, you will have many native pollinators and other insects showing up to your garden. You can't avoid this happening. And this is a good thing. You want your plants to be eaten. Think of your garden as a buffet. So you put the food out, food, the great equalizer, everything eats and they will come. So plant it and they will come. That's one key part of restoring the, the planet. Um, why is it important to see plants as food? Um, because these plants will attract a variety of native pollinators and other insects, you want to avoid making your garden or these native plants an ecological trap. That is something in the environment that will attract organisms like a nightlight, for example. Um, and because of that attraction, it makes it them then easier to be killed through predation or other means. So like the moths at the window at night, um, those are, you, we lose of about 30% of insects at night that are attracted to lights. Um, an easy technique to avoid that hap from happening is to uh, have outdoor lighting on motion sensors or to try amber colored lights, insects aren't as attracted to yellow lights, or to use blackout curtains in your windows. You can get blackout fabric very cheaply by the yard and just tack it up under your curtains. Now, developing your plant palette or your really excellent salad buffet, what to plant? This is always the question. California is a biodiversity hotspot, so we have lots of choices for native plants. We have almost 8,000 species here, more than uh, any other state in the United States, um, some that are not found anywhere else um, in, the, in the entire United States. And we have such a large number of really great plants because we have very unique ecosystems here in California, everything from beaches, redwood forest, deserts, chaparral, um, just a lot of different kinds of environments, but we also have uh, at about 1600 species of native bees. And honeybees, they're, they're not native, so we're not gonna talk about those, but our native bees um, across the United States are about 4,000 species. Um, here in California, again, we have the most uh, native bees of any place um, in the United States. And because insect species including pollinators are declining worldwide, planting native plants is one of the best ways that you can uh, help these insects. Again, why California native plants? Um, if you plant something non-native, that can escape uh, your garden and infest in natural areas um, and destroy natural ecosystems and bring in diseases and exotic insects that wreak havoc on what was there before. 
uh, planty native keeps California looking like California, and California native plants evolved to thrive in our different California climates. So here in the Bay Area, where we get about 16 inches of rain on average um, per year, um, plants are adapted to those uh, conditions. And once they're established, they're, they're very drought tolerant. So they help us save water. What to plant? Where do I find these plants? Okay, so a great resource that's done by the California Native Plant Society um, is a searchable database, which is calscape.org. Super easy to use. Um, and you can create your palette of everything from trees, shrubs, perennials, bulbs, vines, and succulents from here. And here I did a little search on California. You can see we have 7,990 plants native to California. And um, if you click on some of these um, tabs here, um, really helpful uh, information here. Uh, talks a little bit about CalScape, a planting guide, which provides a wealth of information on how to plant and some of the relationships that are a little bit more detailed than I'll go into tonight. Nurseries that might have the plant that you're interested in. Um, you can set up a plant list of your own with an Excel spreadsheet that you can download. And then butterflies. Those are the butterflies and moth species that as caterpillars will eat those plants. This is a key portion of the, the website there. Now, remember I said I studied ingestive behaviors, so I'm taking it back to a better question, I think, than what to plant, but who to feed. And we know that plant species need insects and pollinators to survive. Um, many plants are basically pollinated by insects. There are some wind pollinated plants like grasses and some trees, but most uh, of these plants that are flowering need pollinators. We also know that speciation occurs more rapidly with pollinators. So if you have bees moving the genes around the environment, then you're going to have different variations of the plants popping up more quickly than if the pollen was blowing willy nilly. Okay. Um, and so pollinators, again, are spreading around those plant species for butterfly and moth larva. So when I look for plants, I rank those plants by the number of species that use that plant. And that helps me to, to decide who to feed. And the gist of all of this is that these biological factors then become, I think, more important considerations than the non-biotic factors like climate, geology, and water in determining what to plant. Okay. Um, and here in California, we have 1,368 species of butterflies and moths native to California, so a lot. Um, again, CalScape has a lot of real in-depth information on plant selection, locating the best species for your site, how to establish those plants, irrigation techniques to reduce water use, um, how to mulch with leaves, a lot of really great information here. Another great uh, resource too for native plants, um, if you're really interested in helping pollinators, bees specifically, um, there's a, a 222 page resource that Jeffrey Caldwell did, which is Bee and Insect Associates of the San Francisco Bay Region Plants. Um, he says, California is the Amazon basin of bee diversity, which is true. And um, you can find copies of this resource on various Facebook pages. But basically he goes through and talks about different species of plants and then what, what bee species have been observed on those uh, particular plants. In terms of deciding what to plant first, okay, so the first plant we're gonna talk because we're doing this one plant at a time, we want keystone species of plants. These will form the backbone of your habitat resources. They provide food, shelter, and nesting sites. And remember, keystone species, the ones that hold the arch together, that keystone in the middle, they help other plants actually to survive. And they provide food for dozens or hundreds of other cat of caterpillar species upon which countless other animals uh, depend. So the takeaway technique is include as many keystone species in your garden as possible. Start with one and then keep going from there. So again, what to plant? You, 
the, the way to do it is you plant your keystone trees and shrubs first, then perennials, then bulbs, then vines and succulents. You wanna choose again, those species that provide the most resources, the vegetative resources, leaves and whatnot for larva, nectar and pollen for bees and other pollinators. And there's, in California, there's probably no more important keystone species than oak, not just for the sheer number of species that it supports, but the vast ecosystem services that they provide. Incredible plant. Everybody should have some kind of oak in their yard. If you don't have room for a big uh, coast live oak like this one, Quercus agrifolia, um, and here you can see my six foot three inch tall husband here for scale. Um, you can try uh, the scrub of Quercus berberifolia in a pot. That's actually in my own yard there. And sure enough, that one gets eaten. And so again, you know, but why California native plants? Well, California native plants are largely preferred over non-native plants by pollinators. They, native plants um, depend largely on native pollinators for reproduction. They don't get wind pollinated very efficiently. And the native plants provide the right nutrients for native insect larval development, including bees. And so there are some species of bees that can't raise their young on just any pollen. It has to be very specific. Um, and again, even just a few appropriate native plant species will improve the biological resiliency and can help prevent local extinction uh, of species. Huge abundance of ecosystem services. So one of our gardens, the Gwenda Street Garden in 2018, you can see there's a, a valley oak here in the back, um, some random shrubs there, and then ivy, which was removed. And then after uh, we transformed this area with um, many different kinds of plants. We're always adding things. And this space had been ivy for about 60 years, and we changed it out in about a week. Um, so it can, it can happen. It can be done. Um, another thing that California native plants do is because of their associations with things in the soil, they change the chemistry of the soil. And that encourages other native plants to colonize those areas. And plants in the landscape are a function of the pollinators there. So here at the Primrose Way Garden, for example, I noticed Epilobium ciliatum here that was growing. I didn't plant it. It came in with probably this little bee. This is an Anthrophora species here. The mouth part extended fits the, the flower perfectly. So this beautiful lady is responsible for helping spread these plants around. Your sequence again, how do I do it? You're probably going, ah, where do I start? Well, start with trees. Try to fit in as many trees into your site as possible. And I have a very small yard here. And what we have in our yard already, there's the ash street tree, the mulberry that was here, the plum tree that was here, two apple trees, a big orange tree and a cherry tree. Pretty standard uh, in the lot. But I have added the kind of smaller trees and some not so small trees where I have room. Um, Cirsus occidentalis, the red bud, um, Salix laziolepis, which is actually a willow. And yes, you can grow a willow in your yard. Um, and uh, I water mine, hand water it, so, um, and it seems to be doing fine, um, and a few others. So I have a lot of different species. Once you've crammed in as many trees as you can, add your shrubs, and your shrub layer should be the main uh, focus of your, of your kind of your foundation of plants, once you get your trees in. Um, and really focus on those evergreen shrubs, the ones that don't drop all their leaves at once. You can use bigger shrubs for screening and then lower growing shrubs um, on the interior, interior of your lot to kind of maintain a sense of openness and you can pop in a, a shrub here or there for accent. In your remaining spaces, um, fit in as many grass, grasses, perennials, bulbs, succulents, and ground covers and vines as possible. Um, you wanna have a mix of herbaceous and woody perennials, herbaceous perennials, 
die back and disappear, but then come up again. Uh, woody perennials persist um, year after year uh, above the ground. And of course, don't forget annuals, uh, a great way to get uh, an extra boost uh, at the salad bar for uh, pollinators. Again, we're gonna start with our keystone trees and here we have a big, beautiful oak. And trees perform so many ecosystem services, but one of the main things is that trees help save water and they absorb water from the ground. They release it into the air that cools and helps clean the air. And when they release the water into the air, that's half of the rain cycle. So you probably remember from grade school where you saw the picture of the ocean with the mountain, the cloud rising up, going over to the mountain and dropping the water down. That's only half. The other half comes from trees going up into the atmosphere. Um, lots, of, lots of ecosystem services in terms of helping to reduce floods, filtering rainwater, and so forth. And then here's that, here's that valley oak um, at the Gwinda Street Garden. Uh, really just seems really happy now to have a community of native plants growing with it. I try to uh, increase complexity in my gardens as much as possible. Um, when you increase complexity, what you're doing is you're strengthening strands in a web, okay, that's very complicated. So even if you lose a couple, you still have a pretty good, strong, connected web. And you can connect in all directions, above and below ground, things that uh, tap into the groundwater. You can um, uh, enhance uh, the way that plants go after moisture. So one great way to sort of growth of plants is with a pile of leaves and twigs because moisture will be uh, saved underneath those piles and things that spread by root runners will actually grow towards moisture. Um, Lots of swales, so have a little indentation in your yard where there's a low area for water to collect, and that becomes prime real estate for a lot of different things. You can grow vines up into shrubs and trees. You can have rocks because rocks are another great way to trap moisture in the ground. Lots of different ways to enhance complexity. Complexity is very important. This is something I snagged from the calscape.org planting guide page, which goes into uh, a little bit more detail here where we have, again, the oak with those deep tap roots going down into the groundwater. And then through uh, different kinds of mycorrhiza, which is a fungus that lives in the soil, um, those fungus uh, share nutrients with the roots and they share uh, water along the lateral surface roots with other plants. That's why you start with the trees first and then uh, fit in your other plants. One plant at a time, start with oaks. Um, so I don't want anybody to feel like they're hopeless and helpless to do things, um, but I'm just throwing this in here. Um, this is a great um, resource that NASA provides and you can look at this with dates and uh, ground covers. In fact, if I can click on the link, let's see if this works. This take us to the website here. Yes. Um, so if we're looking at groundwater, we have a left map and a right map. And we go down to, oh, let's go back to January and slide this back. Back in, so this is uh, the right map. This is how things look now. That's how it looked in January. That's groundwater, surface soil moisture. Now, don't be, don't get, don't fret here. Um, surface soil moisture doesn't look too good, okay? We know there's a problem, it's a big one, but don't feel like you can't do something. Native plants are like the easy way to do something. And I'm all about doing things the easy way. Okay, so take heart, you can do something. And so like, for example, uh, what is the depth to your groundwater where you live? And uh, the Santa Clara Valley Water District has an interactive map. Um, and so you can look at Valley Water. And I just put this one up for um, uh, Palo Alto because I was very interested to see what sort of ground, how, how close to the surface the groundwater is here. And red here is about 10 feet. So close to the bay, 10 feet down 
is where the water table is. And I'm assuming that's generally the case for areas that are close, right close to the bay. So we have a high water table here in the Bay Area. So take heart. And then all these blue dots are wells that are monitored um, to see where it is, you know, and I looked recently and our water table is still nice and high here in Palo Alto. So take heart, there's water. Um, and so let's talk about putting in some swales and they don't have to be super gorgeous or anything like that. Um, it's an easy way to direct water back down into the ground, uh, to the groundwater. And a great thing about a swale is that you get some form out of it. And as a landscape architect and a designer, I'm all about form following function. Okay, and so the function here is rainwater. And so this actually, uh, I did this for my neighbor. Um, she has two downspouts that I connected with an arc and there's a low point there. And we just started to plant things just out of the frame there is a valley oak. And as you can see, we've added boulders some native grasses, which this particular one, uh, Alimus glaucus, has a very deep root system that helps channel water down as well. Um, and so uh, the large pebbles also help um, to hold in soil moisture. And something great that I saw, um, uh, a leaf cutter bee was um, nesting under those boulders. Um, they really like to nest in the ground like 70% of our native bees do. But basically, swales are good and they take lots of different forms. So here's another one I designed. And here we have uh, the existing redwood tree. There's actually three that are on site here. You can't see the other two because they're just in back of me. Um, the downspouts enter into the swale and then we have um, boulders and native plants around. So, um, and then boulders, remember they, they, they save the moisture underneath and plants love to come up next to boulders because it's wet under there, nice and cool. So great for the root zone. Again, another um, swale that I designed, this was actually the existing front garden bed. And this particular client had the unconnected downspouts. They didn't go into the storm sewer. And I said, well, let's create some swales. And so we took all of the old plants out. Um, there, wasn't, there weren't any natives. And we have a nicely shallow area here that will hold a lot of water. Um, and we put in some nice river cobble and then the downspouts empty into this. Um, I think there's an outlet somewhere. It's probably hidden behind something. Um, and we replaced the lawn with a native sod blend. So when you start with your, your first plant, one plant at a time, remember, so how do you decide on the tree for your location? Um, go back to um, Calscape and you can do search by a location. You can do it Alameda County, you can do Santa Clara County um, and see what pops up here in Santa Clara County. What pops up is Quercus lobata, the valley oak, which used to form 61% uh, of the tree cover here in the valley. Um, and then rank, you can rank these trees by the number of moths and butterflies that are hosted. So it sorts them for you and then choose, maybe the first one is too big. So you go down the list till you find one that will fit. Then look for the nursery where they have it and go get it, plant it up. Um, if you don't see something that you like, you can extend your search radius a little bit more and find something that works well that way. Um, so again, no other trees come close to delivering all the eco services that oaks provide. Um, here's at the Hopkins Avenue Garden. There is a beautiful valley oak already there. And um, as again, you know, the 61% of the tree cover here in Santa Clara Valley, um, they provide critical ecosystem support. Now the valley oak will drop its leaves during its, the year which is great because those leaves are ecosystem gold and you'd leave those leaves under the tree to help support the health of the tree. The taproot will go down and seek water. <clears throat> um, you can grow native plants underneath like Bonardella, the coyote mint. Um, you don't wanna grow non-native plants underneath an oak tree because that will adversely affect the health of the tree. And 
no other tree has been referred to as an insect factory like the valley oak. Uh, they, the valley oaks actually grow pretty quickly and they can live for 600 years. So you can plant it for you know, eight generations down the line. Um, a great resource to find out more about oaks. Um, this is a live link here. Um, this is the uh, re-oaking Silicon Valley. Um, and it's a nice publication that talks about the historical detail of oaks and how best to place them to get the best uh, ecosystem services. Because you don't want to be all random about where they go. You want to be very strategic and thoughtful about where the oaks are going. Another great resource, oak, oak, oak. It's tonight we're talking about the oaks. Um, Dr. Tallamy, Doug Tallamy, who is a professor uh, at, of entomology at the University of Delaware, just came out with this book, The Nature of Oaks. I highly recommend it. So um, uh, read that for, for fun. So we've, we've exhausted the topic of oaks. I could probably go on, and I may still. Um, but let's talk about shrubs. So again, pick your keystone shrubs. Um, search your county, um, then rank by the number of butterflies and moths hosted. Choose what will fit in your size um, for size location um, uh, um, needs. And then um, look at water needs. Is it low, super low water? Many of these shrubs are super low water use. Um, and again, you can expand your search area a little bit if you don't see something that you like. Add in your perennials. And um, we have uh, all of these in our gardens and the abundance of wildlife is just incredible. So um, I'm not going to go into detail here, but a lot of these um, you can see in our gardens and um, decide which ones that you want to have in yours. Uh, again, annuals super cheap way to add uh, native plants. Um, if you don't have a huge budget, um, annuals are great. They grow quickly and flower and then go to seed all in one year. That's why they call them annuals. Three easy ones are poppies, which are their native state native flower. So um, why not have poppies in your garden? Lots of different species of poppies actually. Um, we have uh, Gilia capitata and uh, Phacelia. Phacelia species, actually a member of the borage family, which is, uh, provides lots of tasty nectar. Um, so really easy to plant a lot of annuals. And beautiful too. Here's a Clarkia amoena. Um, I mean, how could you not want a big lush swath of these in your garden? Just really pretty. Super easy from seed. I think I just basically threw these on the ground. Um, and they reseed in place to so have them year after year. Um, raising plants from seed is super easy. A lot of times when we plant a cultivar, it's been taken, it's been, it's been grown from a cutting of a plant. So it is basically a clone and it's, there's no genetic diversity. It, I raise a lot of things from seeds because um, I like to experiment with different plants. And if you want to experiment with a lot of different kinds of plants, seeds are a cheap way to go. And one way I can do, I call it my frustration-free method of planting uh, or seed sowing is I'll take a, a wet coffee filter and label it with indelible ink, what it, I'm putting in there, um, and then put it into a plastic baggie and put it into the fridge. And that's what's called cold moist stratification. And then I check the, the refrigerator every few days. And when the seeds start to sprout, then I pot them up. And that, that way I know that they have sprouted and I'm not waiting a year for something to germinate. Um, some things do take a year and they sit in the fridge for a year, but they, you know, seeds want to grow. And so um, it's a great way to, to increase genetic diversity is to grow things from seed. Another great thing to try is try growing native bulbs from seeds. Some bulb seeds are hard, um, some are easy. In my experience, I found the fritillarias to be pretty easy to germinate. Um, it, they're a time commitment because it'll probably be about three to four years before I have a bloom and a bulb. But um, you know, sometimes these plants are hard to find and um, the reward will be all mine in four years. 
Um, a great reference book that I like for the homeowner um, and the garden enthusiast is the California Native Landscape. This has great design tips, um, a lot of great science tips, wonderful reference guide. And then some people ask me, can you give us a plant list? So what I've done here is this is an imaginary garden with the species that I would plant if I had this particular garden. And if you zoom in really close, you can see there's a little oak right there. Okay, so things are labeled, um, but these have the species that I would grow. Um, again, think about your design as a buffet. I mean, if you're going to a salad bar buffet, which is basically what a garden is, do you wanna to go to a buffet that maybe has iceberg lettuce and tomatoes and maybe some chickpeas and one kind of dressing? Or do you want to go to a buffet that has 20 different kinds of greens and a lot of things that you can add, lots of seeds maybe that go on the top, four or five different kinds of dressing, you know, maybe some bacon bits. So variety, um, everybody loves variety. Um, so, you know, this basically goes over some of the things that I talked about. Um, start with one, but you want to have at least 20 different species for a really good effect. Um, you want to try to reduce your paving as much as possible because many things do, uh, many bees uh, species, 70% nest in the ground. Uh, create a downspout swale. There's no reason to, unless you have, you know, 10 swimming pools of water off of coming off your roof. Um, try to get a swale in your garden um, if you can. Put it right back into your own uh, groundwater. Um, and plant... Um, at all scales, the large stuff, the medium stuff, and then the small stuff. Your basic plant layout. So how do you space things out? So consider the mature diameter of the plant, okay? And then um, when you have a to scale map, then draw the plants in if you're, when you're doing your plan um, and, you know, put the mature diameter. These things will grow to their mature diameter and then, um, show different species um, kind of touching or overlapping on the edges um, to start with. Over time, you can definitely add more, but that's a good way to start. Just a few pictures of some of our native pollinators that we have. And in my own home garden, the more native plants I've added, it's, it's buzzing with activity. And females um, are the only ones that have stingers and they're not interested in stinging. They're these little leaf cutter bees like this one here. Um, they might make nine baby bees in a season before they die. So she's not really interested in doing anything but gathering nectar and pollen for her offspring because bees are vegetarians. They don't eat anything else um, as larva other than uh, nectar and pollen. And um, the uh, adults, will eat some pollen, um, but they mostly thrive on nectar, which is basically uh, nutritional sugar water for them. Um, remember I said that some species won't uh, be able to rear their young on just any pollen, pollen specialists. So asters are good. Um, you can see a lot of different kinds of bees on asters as well. How do you take care of it? Um, the adult, Lifespan of a bug is very short, an insect. Usually they spend months or years as eggs or larva. Um, so you wanna keep that in mind. So you're gonna have larva in your garden. Don't worry about that, that's what you want. Um, the main thing in a native plant garden because um, the, the, the plants will change the chemistry of the soil um, because of what they the roots in, uh, emit in terms of hormones and the mycorrhiza. Keep the weeds at bay at the beginning and then they'll decrease naturally over time. Um, irrigation should encourage uh, the roots to search for water. Uh, the less you do to the soil, the better. Don't fertilize. Um, and I leave the leaves everywhere. I don't use leaf blowers, pesticides for herbicides, but nothing that will kill anything. So I basically try not to clean, clean up the garden. Um, I let, let things tell me, um, you know, what I need to do. So it's really not very much maintenance, mostly weeding, 
uh, but that becomes less over time. Um, these nests in the soil, so you want some bare soil for those. And then again, uh, because insects spend a lot of times as uh, larva or eggs, uh, look closely before you prune or don't prune at all. Um, a lot of times the dry stems and twigs have another function rather than just being a dry twig, twig or stem. Um, they, pro they provide spaces for insects to lay eggs. And um, not just this, this wasp here, but a lot of other bee species will lay eggs in, in stems. So if you do feel like pruning, leave about 12 inches um, at the bottom for the, um, the cavity nesters to go in there and lay her eggs. Um, like I said, I literally don't clean up the gardens. I let things sprout from seeds and grow up over the old stuff. And once these plants get going again, um, you don't see the debris at the bottom. Here's a little oak coming up, yay, um, through the leaf litter. And plants will grow up through leaf litter. They will grow up through old stems and twigs. I like to think that these gardens are complex and low maintenance because I just let stuff grow up through the old stuff. Super easy. I leave old stems in place, like on this verbena, that is kind of like a scaffolding to hold new growth. And then, um, as I said before, sometimes dry twigs and stems have other functions. So these fluffy uh, flower seed heads from the asters are actually nest material for hummingbirds. And, you know, complexity. Remember, get as much complexity as possible because everybody's looking for a place to lay eggs as an adult. And so at the Gwynna Street Garden, we have a pile of logs, lots of little niches there. And then in my own home garden, a leaf cutter bee. She was so cute. Um, here we have her in slow motion coming out of a bamboo uh, stake. And <laughs> I had no idea. So Leave the leaves, uh, leaves are shelter for all kinds of insects. Um, and they are ecosystem gold. Um, they, leaves hold water in place like a sponge. They filter water, they hold in soil moisture. Moisture is good. Remember that slider that showed us the low soil moisture, leave your leaves. Don't shred them up either <laughs> um, because things live in them. And leaves help with, um, fungus growing in your soil. Remember those mycorrhiza. So mycorrhiza and oak leaf litter. This is actually at the Hopkins Garden. And I only have a couple of slides left, but you can see here, um, this is the top layer. And the white threads that you see, that's all mycorrhiza growing in the leaf litter. Um, I tell you, the valley oak leaf litter, ecosystem gold. Mycorrhiza is what you want. Again, avoid creating an ecological trap. Remember, if you set the buffet with your plants, you will have these insects showing up. It's a guarantee. And we've already talked about how to prevent some of the uh, ecological trap things. Um, don't use leaf blowers, reduce light pollution at night, um, reduce the, the smells of things like lawn, lawnmowers that have gas. Um, Eliminate the use of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides because those things can get into the soil where bees nest. Um, so, you know, just a few things that you can do to enhance what you're doing already in terms of planting native plants. So, look closely before you do something. Um, information isn't revealed all at the same time. Okay, it's not, you don't know everything instantly. And through observation, looking closely, you learn things. Um, and so I discovered that this particular caterpillar, Neoterpes edwardsata, really likes to eat poppies. And birds like to eat these. So poppies are a great thing to grow. And then I was taking a picture of this uh, plant because um, I was interested in looking at the pollen. But I did not notice the uh, little katydid dead nymph here. Um, it was only later I saw it when I enlarged the photograph, but it certainly saw me. So observation is key. 
And finally, <laughs> be empowered. Um, amongst the other ecosystem services, the more that you understand about these interrelationships in nature, you'll understand how to optimize the productivity of native plant habitats, which leads to your enhancement, uh, enhancement of your appreciation and your role in nature's complex beauty. And literally, you know, be empowered, plant some oaks, um, let's, let's get that water cycle going, let's cool down the Bay Area and um, increase the tree cover and enjoy the abundant life that you'll see. And that uh, is the end of my presentation. Virtual round of applause. <laughs> that was amazing. I think you should add photographer to your bio. Some of those pictures were <laughs> top notch. So um, guests and participants, please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A. What we'll do is just go through them um, first come first serve. And then if um, we get all the questions answered, but as I said, just keep adding them as they come. So are you ready to take some questions, Juanita? Absolutely. Okay, so the first one is um, from Nancy and she says, so many of these plants hate clay soil. How do I fix my clay soil? Ah, so there, there are two ways that you can go about this. One is you can find plants that like clay soil um, because clay soil will, if it dries out, um, it becomes very hard to, to plant it, but it will stay moist. Um, and so find things that like to be in moist, heavy soils. That's one thing to do. So if you don't wanna do the hard work of trying to amend the soil, um, if you are going to plant in a heavy clay soil, uh, try to try to dig those holes during the winter time, and then um, use something like cactus mix to kind of uh, break it up a little bit, and then um, you know use leaf litter from those plants to uh, encourage things to um, come up from the underneath and sort of like eat the leaves and then pull the nutrients that they then uh, use down into the soil and they will, uh, things will help aerate the soil. So uh, two different methods, depending on what your um, ultimate goal is. Great, thank you. I know that can be tough. Yes. Um, so the second question is from Amy and she said, we're inspired by the Tilden Park Botanical Garden and have been planting as many different species as possible. Is there a danger of not having enough of each species to support the insects that feed on each? Ah, so uh, what's generally recommended for pollinators is to plant in mass of a single species at least three feet in diameter. Think more is better. Um, some bees take all the pollen from a thousand flowers to make one bee. <laughs> so it's a lot of work. So that's really why you only get about, you don't, you don't get hundreds of bees from one female. You only get a handful at a time. Um, the other thing too is the way that you can tell if you're not providing enough of a resource is if let's say you have one coffee berry planted in your yard and that thing is eaten down to a nubbins, plant more because you know that something's eating it um, and they're eating that coffee berry out of house and home. So plant more of those things. So those are two ways to tell and are the two methods. So if you know, you know, things are eating something and it's getting eaten down to the bare branches, don't take it out, plant more of that or plant in, a, in masses, the more the merrier. Yeah, that's a good question, Amy, thank you. Okay, so the next two are just some clarifying questions. Um, so Laura asks, can you please repeat the name of the small oak that can be grown in a pot? Yes, that is uh, the, scrub, the scrub oak, which is the common name, or Quercus berberitifolia. There are a couple of other small oaks that are scrub oaks as well, and um, but in the Bay Area, it's Quercus berberitifolia um, that we have, um, and pretty easy to find in nurseries that are native plant nurseries. Scrub oaks. Okay, that would be good for people with apartments or patios, stuff like that too. Absolutely. 
Um, okay, so D asked, what is the name of the native sod used next to the swale? I I believe, yes, I think that's probably Delta bluegrasses no mo. Um, and Delta bluegrass is a sod company, a grass company that is actually out in the Delta and they do have a native sod blend, a couple of several different ones actually. And I think that was the no mo. Um, and I think it uses about a third of the water as a regular uh, non-native lawn. Great. Okay, so are ants good for the garden? Ants clean things up. <laughs> um, if you've ever seen them dogpiling on a dead insect, that's what they do. They are nature's custodians. Um, so yes, they are. I don't particularly like them crawling on me, but they have a function. <laughs> I really don't like them crawling on me. It just freaks me out um, because they remind me of like neurons with legs, the way that they act in mass. Um, but they do have a function. And I just, when I see um, them boiling out of the ground, if I've moved something and there's a nest, I give them time to go about their business and then come back later. All right, so the next question is, um, do birds transport oak acorns? I have had volunteers show up without any oaks nearby and wonder where, they're, where they came from. Yes. <laughs> um, blue jays will um, transport them um, and squirrels too will bury them. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in our uh, gardens where we've removed ivy and planted natives is what we have oaks coming up everywhere and they they become almost kind of weedy after a while which is kind of what you want um, and so it's wonderful to have these volunteers but yes birds will um, drop them in the in the gardens um, I think probably in the suburban garden is likely going to be squirrels moving them around ah Okay, so feel free to add your questions to the Q&A. Um, I'll read the last two from the Q&A and then Giselle, do you mind reading the ones from the chat? So the next question is, um, how are moths beneficial for the garden? So moths are great because they spend time as larva and um, they are eaten by birds. And um, so moths are good and some moths actually pollinate flowers and so one question I got from a last webinar, Zoominar, was somebody said, I don't have any pollinators. And it's like, well, are your plants setting seed? Well, yes. Well, that means you have pollinators. Might be you have nighttime pollinators like moths. Um, the heavy lifting for pollination basically comes from bees, but there are species of moths that do pollinate. Um, they come out at night or um, early morning hours or late late evening, um, they come out. Um, but most, of the, I think, the main function of moths is to provide protein for the food chain. Great. I think I'm frozen. <laughs> you're you're good for me. Oh, good. Okay, so the next question from KB before we get to the chat is, um, I'm enjoying my native garden, but I'm faced with an invasion of English fox squirrels, which are killing young fledglings, chewing down new plants, sunflower stems, for example, gnawing on trees and bark, and sharpening their teeth on patio furniture. <laughs> Are you aware of any deterrents? Um, Squirrels are a big problem in my own garden. And so what I do is um, if I want to have birds nesting, I'll have um, predator proof nest boxes. Um, and then to protect uh, newly planted things, I will use chicken wire. Um, there's really no other way to stop a squirrel who is determined, except with some kind of a physical barrier um, and um, or uh, a big dog, perhaps, even though they can't be out there all the time. You definitely don't want your cats out there. 
Um, that's counter in, uh, counterproductive. Um, unless you have like the bird be safe uh, fluffy collar on them, that's a brightly colored collar that fits over. It's like a scrunchie for their collars that birds see the color. Yes, there's actually a thing. Um, but yeah, squirrels, the, the best way to really help with the squirrel problem is to, on your new stuff, to protect it as best as you can with a um, chicken wire or hardware cloth. All right, so first question from the chat is, I planted lots of California poppies along the perimeter of my garden. What can I plant next for added wonder? Ooh, so many things. I, you know, these days I'm really into the, here's a fun word for you, the geophytes, the bulbs, right? Um, because bulbs are, I mean, why plant a daffodil when you can plant Tritillea, Brodea, Fritillea, you know, all these great sounding plants because they will come up like a daffodil, um, bloom, attract all kinds of native pollinators, and then they'll die back. And most of our native bulbs don't want summer water. So really a great way to, um, to provide kind of a mix of colors. And there's so many different kinds of geophytes, these bulbs. Um, you know, the interspersed with our poppies, Another thing I like to do is I like to put in Phasalia tanacetifolia in with poppies because poppies basically provide only pollen. They don't provide nectar. And the Phasalia provides both, but it really provides a very high quality nectar. So that combination is basically one-stop shopping for, um, for bees. Awesome. That'll be a fun project for sure. Um, Next question from the chat. About how long does it take to put together a garden like the ones you've put in Palo Alto? Also, where do you find California natives? Can you find them at any normal nursery or are there specific places to look? So how long does it take? Um, well, the gardens are evolving over time. And when I design a garden, I shoot for 20 different species to start with funding considerations being the main driver of that. Um, so I try to get in the things like Arctostaphylis, Ceanothus, Areogonum, um, Heteromeles, you know, some of the larger backbone shrubs if I don't already have an oak tree there. If I, if I have an oak tree, that's great. Sometimes I'll, I'll squish in a couple of scrub oaks. Um, so you can, you can design it out and have the backbone in in a single year but then keep adding plants year after year. And so, you know, the, the garden is not really a one and done because there's always more that you want to get and fit in, especially as you become more obsessed with the plants. Um, and yes, um, finding the plants. So most nurseries, like you're not going to find a nice selection of natives at, you know, the Home Depot. It's not going to happen. Um, you're going to find them at native plant nurseries and Calscape has if you see a plant that you like, it has a list of nurseries. You can click on that. It'll take you to the nursery's website and it'll show you their availability list, whether they have that in inventory at the moment, how much it costs. Super easy to find the plants. Um, but you want to go with your native plant nurseries first. Thank you. And thank you, Giselle, too. So we have a few more questions here. The next one is from Louise and um, they ask, we have a 30 year old Ceanothus, buckwheat, yarrow, various ribe species and many native perennials and annuals. We could use some more mulch. Any recommendations that you can buy? P.S. they're all in clay soil. Yes, yes. Is, um, one of the nice mulches that we have recently used um, was a premium arbor mulch that we got a nice donation from Lingso. Um, and that, it's nicely high quality. It's not uh, chunks of things, um, but it's, it's more finer and fluffier texture. That will break down a little bit more quickly, I think. Um, bark chips though, like the mini mulch actually will encourage more fungal decomposition. And if you can get, if you don't already have an oak, um, I would say plant one up 
um, so that you can get the leaves. Um, and also, if you see your neighbors getting rid of their oak leaves, <laughs> offer the service of removing them yourself. They're just bagging them up and leaving them or throwing them in their green bin. Um, you know, those are, remember, ecosystem gold. And you know, if you can get those, uh, use those as well. Great. OK, so should um, naf naphids be controlled? Aphids. Aphids. Uh, aphids. Um, aphids are, are a tasty snack for little birds. Um, you know, and I leave aphids. I don't care what they're doing because everything is something else's meal in the insect world, literally. I mean, I've seen battles, things, heads getting pulled off and stuff between various insects. But birds, little birds like finches love aphids um, and will, will, you know, clean out your garden quickly. Just leave them. Good to know. All right, last question of the night. Um, what native plants are not attractive to gophers? Um, the ones that have a wire cage around their root ball. <laughs> um, so that's a good question. Um, you know, they gophers want a tunnel, and so uh, and they want to eat things underground. And um, if you're planting something that's very special, I would say to uh, to put in a chicken wire cage first to protect the, the main root structure, um, and then um, to uh, put up a raptor perch so that um, you can have a hawk swoop in and help you. Remember, it's a big food chain out there. And so everybody's looking for a meal. And so you can help that along. <laughs> um, but, you know, really a physical barrier is probably the best bet. All right. Well, thank you so much, Juanita. Again, if you were in person, we'd be applauding you. Uh, and thank you all for participating. We had over 40 guests join us tonight. So hope you all learned something. I know I did. Um, but yeah, go out and celebrate Earth Day tomorrow. Hope this kicks off your celebration this week. And thanks again, Juanita, but have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.